Uh, we're going to talk about I left out. But before we do that, we just, I love, don't you love what Ian is doing? Yeah. I think we should get him back up here so I can sit down and listen to him. <laughs> but we, 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 as a church, we've, we've done a lot of things that has actually stunted the growth of the people of God. And one of the things we've done is we've over-literalized the scripture. Okay? The scriptures are written with letters, but according to the Hebrew tradition, the letters are spirit. The Hebrew letters are spirit. They are beings. They are not just scripts. Because only beings can embody beings. Only beings can carry beings. Trees don't give birth to human. So the letters that God used to write the scriptures were supposed to capture the spirit and the being of God in their essence. So when Paul writes and says, the letter kill it, but the spirit gives life. When Jesus speaks, he says, the word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So the letters that were used were used from a spiritual dimension. Therefore, everything in the scriptures have a spiritual being and has some secret written within it beyond what you see in your eyes. So we're going to look at very simple stuff. I mean, now I know you guys know the deep stuff, but let's look at some, some simple stuff. We're going to talk about the Alpha and the Omega. The Aleph and the Tau. Now, there are two words in scripture that are translated mark, okay? One is the oath, aleph. I uh, know when I keep starting talking like this, some of you won't know what I'm saying. This is an aleph. All right? Really, it is, it is three yods conjoined together, okay? Three yods. This is a yod. Or if you may, this is a yod. All right? It's that small. Okay? Now, Aleph is three yods. All right? Joined together, which means it is Y, Y, Y. All right? Y, Y, Y equals 30. Right? And you know, you have, he has talked a lot about this numerical stuff, so you know these things. So, why, the A is not just. One, it's also 30 because it represents the Trinity. All right? It is one, but it's also three. So, <laughs> in numerical form, yeah? So, when you, when you take this and Jesus says, I am the Alpha, which is this. And by the way, the three Y's are the platform for creation. We talk about the Y chromosome and all that stuff, but it is. The Yod is the foundation, the Yesod of creation. Okay, that's Yesod is the Hebrew word for foundation. Now, you know, we can go all of this. Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. Okay? But in this thing, three also equals one. Remember that. Because there's three in one. There's one and there's three. Three is the triangular completion of divinity. Okay? In God's self. In, in a relationship with God's self. With himself. All right? So when you do this. But also, this is also. Can I do this? This is a flame of fire. But this is fire burning downward, and this is fire burning upward, and this is fire flowing between them. It's a simple stuff, but it's there, okay? Now, it is an aleftau, but there's a difference, okay? An aleftau is what Jesus calls himself, which is this, when he says Alpha and Omega. I want to show you something. That's a tav. But a tav is a noon. This is a noon, Okay? And noon is fish or water or salt water. Okay? 
But not any water, it's salt water. Because Mayim, which, which is M, okay? That's what Mayim is, is salt water. And this is salt water, this is water, ordinary water, okay? And there's a reason why this is salt water, okay? We're going to come back to that. So the tav is made up of what? It's made up of a nun and a dalet. A dalet, which is the number four, which is the number for a doorway that has no gate, has no closing. A doorway into infinity. All right? That's what a, that's what a dalet is. It's a doorway with no door. And by the way, when Jesus says, I am the door, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about, I'm a door, and there is no key to the door. There is no, when you get into it, you can go wherever you want to go. All right? And the problem is, I, I, I keep talking to church folk, I keep asking, if Jesus is the door, and he says, through me, the sheep go in and out and find pasture. You know, what? What is the pasture that we're looking for? Right? We, if, you, if, you, if you really believe that Jesus is the door, then you got to begin to understand that that is an opening, an open invitation for you to go wherever you want. Any dimension you want. Any direction you want. You still with me? So, he is the Aleph and the Tau, okay? A Dalet and this. Now, a Dalet is a doorway. Noon is salt water. Salt water is more conductive than just ordinary water. We haven't done that yet, but water is, we've talked about it, it's a superconductor, yeah. right? Yeah. So, if there is a doorway and water, the invitation is go get your boat and travel. All right? But this is also, this is the cross. That's a towel. A towel from this is what you get your, your tea, which is your tav, which is a doorway into infinity. And by the way, the tav, which is the cross of Jesus Christ, allows you to travel simultaneously, immediately to different dimensions without actually moving from where you are. The cross has not been used the way it's supposed to be. It's not just something for you to look at. It's not just a sign up there. It is the capacity to sit in one place and travel without actually moving and be omnipresent in every dimension you want to be Okay, let's try this. Jesus says, Jesus says, so that where I am, there you may be also. Where is Jesus? So, okay, if Jesus is everywhere, that means that simultaneously, immediately, there is a principle of immediacy in which you, by being in Christ, you are everywhere. But you're not everywhere in terms of the things that have been created. You are everywhere potentially in things that are still in the mind of God that has not been manifested yet. Now, this is not church stuff. <laughs> because... Immediacy is not what we talk about as human beings. But if God created you and says, okay, where I am, that's where you're going to be. And if your God is not in the throne somewhere sitting like a man uh, eating pizza, then you have to understand that if God is omnipresent, if God is everywhere, then by virtue of your being in him, you are also everywhere. It's just that you don't know how to get there consciously yet. You are already there because of your relationship with him. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Come on, guys. 
The last time I read, the scripture said, the scripture said, last time I read, the scripture said this. It said, he that is born of the flesh is flesh. He that is born of spirit is spirit. Didn't say becomes a spirit. It says is spirit. And the Bible says, and the wind blows and whether it will, and no one knows where it's coming from and where it's going. So are those who are born of the spirit. So those who are born of the spirit are in places they have not even recognized they are. So the job of what we do is to raise your consciousness for you to know where you already are. I don't, it's in the book. So that where I am, there you may be also. Uh, Let me, let me, let me do a sidetrack just a little bit. In John chapter 14, when we talk, uh, most Christians believe Jesus went to prepare a place for them. And he went to prepare a cubicle. (laughs) A city where you'll be walking on gold. But it's not really what the passage says. Read it again. The passage says, what? It says, in my father's house, there are many, many mansions. It does not mean rooms, dimensions. A room is a dimension in a house. And God's house, God's house is not a small city sitting somewhere. God's house is the universe, which by extension, God's house is God himself. So if God's house is God, then guess what? There is nothing that is not in God, right? That means in God's very personal being, there are so many dimensions that it will take you eternity to even go to just a few of them. But since you are already in eternity, you are present in all those places. So now let's get back to this now. So when Jesus says, he says, he says, he says, If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. Most Christians read it this way. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, period, I go to prepare a place for you. Who talks like that? (laughs) What? Who talk? Do you talk like that? Do you say, if it were not so, I would have told you after you already? He says, in my father's house. There are many mansions. If the mansions were not there, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you so that when I'm done, I'll come get you back. The same guy that says to you, where I am there, you shall be also. Why will he be telling you that he's going to prepare a place? If the mansions are already in his house. Well, watch this now. Watch. I want to show you something in scripture. If the mansions are already prepared, then that means that whatever you are going to need before you even came into the world. God already did it. God didn't wake up one morning and say, oops, I think I need to prepare a place for them. (laughs) Matthew chapter 24 says this. It says, come ye into what? The kingdom or the inheritance prepared for you. What's the next verse? Say it with me, before the foundation of the world. So if it's been prepared before the foundation of the world, why do you think he's going back to prepare it again? You are the one that's been prepared, not the place. You are the one that needs preparation. And here's, okay. All right. And you need preparation because of what has happened to you. You read preparation because of what happened to the earth. The earth is not a time creation. It's an eternal creation. I I always love that these creationists, uh, Westerners, who come to me to tell me that the earth is 7,000 years old. And I say that means that my grandmother's cooking place is older than the earth. I mean, how do you tell an Egyptian who's kingdom was numbered by the rotation and revolution of the sun, not the earth. The revolution of the sun takes 25,000 years. 
So how do you tell Egyptians that the earth is 7,000 years? And by the way, it's only Europeans that think this way. Africans don't think that way. Jews don't think that way. I want to ask you another question. And I know I'm going, to, I'm going to be in trouble with some creationist guys. But watch this. I'm not talking about evolution. I'm talking about earth. Okay? Genesis chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3 has no time measure. That's right. But the earth existed before light was put into darkness so that it can transform the darkness. And you can't measure something without time. You get the point? So if the earth was there in the waters before God said, let there be light, who has the capacity to measure the earth before there was light? That's why when the scientists put their, their measurement on the stuff, it goes <laughs> billions and billions. And Christians are sitting around saying, well, you know, the earth is 7,000 years. How do you know? You get the point. So the earth existed before God said, let there be light. You can't really measure anything on this earth without light and shadow. Are you, you, you get my point? And we need to get off all that stuff of trying to make things literal that were not meant to be made literal. Oh, I know I've just lost some disciples here. <laughs> huh? And, and, and we, we, we bypass passages of scripture that says that the earth endures forever. There is a passage that says that. I know that. The earth fell from eternity into time. It fell from darkness into light. I can tell you some other stuff. The earth, according to Genesis chapter 1, traveled through dark space, or dark matter, or whatever you want to call it, black hole, to get here. It is a, it, the earth is a ship. You don't like that? It's a traveling device. It has water, and it has the capacity for traveling. God nested the earth on this side because God wanted to create you, and in creating you, Keep you here until you are mature before you are destroyed so that he can do what he wants to do with you. You, you, you were not ready to, to face the other galaxies and to face the other creation. Okay? And God wanted to create something that carried the DNA of God that's nested in a corner, trained until it is mature and manifest the fullness of God according to Ephesians chapter 4, that you come to the fullness of God, not the fullness of yourself. It's right there. The Bible teaches that God's goal is to bring you to the fullness of God. Genesis chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. Still, still with me? Or should I just turn over to Ian right now? So when we deal with the Aleph Tau, <laughs> when we deal with the Aleph Tau, we are dealing with God's capacity to reach back upon himself, double back upon himself, if you may. And in doing so, can I, can I use a, a, a symbol that might offend some of you here? I'm going to do it anyway. In Africa, we have snakes that bite their tails. Yeah, that put their tails into their mouth. That's where you get the Ouroboro, the round stuff from. Even people in occultism knows this. Right? And most cultures use that circle as the symbol of the continuation of life. Come on, don't, 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 don't get me yet. I haven't even started. So the Alpha and the Omega is what? Is the divine cycle. This is what Ian has been talking about, which I enjoy so much. Okay? Aleph Tau. 
But a left eye is God's personal symbol. It is never put upon anybody else but God. Now, here's the, here's the thing. When God put the mark upon Cain, remember that passage? This is what he used. He put this in the middle, which is a valve, right? But it's a valve holem. So it's an oath, okay? One of the reasons God put that on Cain was because Cain needed protection. God said, I'm the only one that can kill him. It was a mark of mercy, not a mark of destruction. And by the way, Cain is the only one that has ever had this mark that close. Do you know why God put that on Cain and decided to protect him? Because that was not just God putting a mark on Cain so people wouldn't kill him. It was also a, a mark upon Cain so he will not transfer the brooding of the serpent onto the other line. It's a boundary creating mechanism. Could, could you repeat that? <laughs> Get the city. <laughs> but, 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 so now, so, so we're dealing now, we're dealing now with, <laughs> I want to show you something else. The, the, you know, God does not use this mark unless there is something to protect and something to cover. Now, the only person that carried this mark in his fullness, and I will tell you something I believe, I believe Jesus had this. He, had the, he, had the, he was the Aleph because he is the son. He is the Messiah. He is the Aleph. He is the... You've heard the statement, ace, holding an ace in your back, right? Yeah. That, yeah. You've heard that statement, right? Yeah. The ace is God. And that's what God was holding. The reason God began creation with a B. By the way, the Bible begins with a B. It doesn't begin with an A. The Hebrew Bible begins with bait. Not a left. Bereshit bara Elohim asamahim vahad haaretz. It begins with bait, okay? And the reason is because God is the Aleph. You start with the B because the B must be within the Aleph and the Aleph must serve as the boundary for everything God's made, God makes. And that's something about Aleph is that Aleph is expansive. Talk about it. You scientists, you know what, you know that the Bible, that uh, your scientific Bible says that we live in an ever-expanding. But Einstein said something because he was a Jew. He said, God is the ever-expanding universe. And if God is the ever-expanding universe, it means that, guess what? That the universe is only trying to catch up with God. All right. Can we go back to Genesis chapter 1? Bereshit bara Elohim asamayim. Bereshit. In the beginning, not from the beginning, not when it began, not because it began, but in. It is a locative term, not a chronological term. It's not chronology. It's the beginning has no point. Because God says, I am the beginning and the end. I am the alpha and I am the omega. So if the world began in the beginning, now this is, by the way, this is where Christians run because they think if you say that, that means that the world is inside of God. Of course the world is inside of God. 
You can't run away from the truth just because you don't like what the Hindus are saying. You get the point? If it's in the beginning, it means it's located in God. The world cannot start outside of God. Nothing exists outside of God. You cannot get behind God. You cannot get ahead of God. You can only stay inside of God. And this is this now. And if it's inside of God, right? That's why the scriptures, in, especially the New Testament, uses this word, in Christ, in Christ, in God, in God, in God. Because you live and move and have your being in Him. You are not stuck locationally. You are not stuck. You're only stuck if you want to be. You still with me? Yeah. All right. The beginning and the end. Not the beginning to the end. And the reason, if you, if you look at the, this is the word for, we're going to talk about this in a second. This is the word for and, the, the V, the valve that you actually talk about. It is a nail, Right? But it's also a hook, not a hook that catches fish, but a hook that connects. This is not a zayin, which is a hook that draws you away. This is a valve, which is a hook that connects curtains. All right? So let's move from that. So if God is a left tau, it means that whatever begins within God really has no end. You have eternal life because you're in God, right? You have eternal life. Well, let's, let's, let's work on that just a second. Do you have everlasting life or do you have eternal life? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's scary, brother. <laughs> do you have everlasting life or do you have eternal life? There's a difference between eternal life and everlasting life. I think it's a nonsense to say Christians have everlasting life. It's not everlasting. Because the devil will live forever. The sinners will live forever. According to the scripture. They'll be there. They might be annihilated. But still. Things don't just up and go away. Okay. Even when annihilated. They're annihilated from memory. Not from a. Okay. That's right. There's annihilation by the way. But it's not annihilation the way you think about it. Okay. Listen carefully. There is annihilation. Some they will, souls will be, the memory will be annihilated completely from record. All right? But as the memory is annihilated from God, so is the memory of God annihilated from the people. It's a double edged sword. The annihilation of memory does not work from, on one side alone. You get, you, are, you, are you listening to me? There is, and I know, I know, I know, you're looking at Ian. I know, I know why you're doing that. But I'm not contradicting. I'm telling you some things that you need to know. All right? The annihilation of memory is a two sided sword. Because the person that God annihilates their memory from himself, also, God annihilates God's memory from them, and that is hell. Let's get back to this. When you, when, you, when, you think, when you begin to think about this, you understand that everlasting life is different from eternity. Eternity means without beginning and without end. When Christ came into the world, he came to give you eternal life. That means he came to restore the life and the DNA of God into you so that you can be who you were born to be. Because it doesn't say he that is born of God will be spirit. But he that is born of God is spirit. And the Bible says God is spirit. Right? So you and I participate in the DNA of God at a level that gives us the life of God. We are like our father. And if we're not like him, then we don't have a part in him.
Am I boring you? Now, I don't want to preach now. You know, he's trying to get me to preach. Let's teach, okay? So we, we are dealing with the Aleph. Let me show you this, what I showed you about there. When God wanted to save the people in Israel in the book of Ezekiel, he did this. He said to the angel, put this. Not this. Because when God puts this on you, even though it is a mark of divinity, you get limited. All right? But when he puts this on you, it's different. Let's look at the stuff. This is a noon. A noon is 50. Eh? This is a dalet. Dalet is what? Four. So it's 54. 54 is nine. Nine is three times. Is the divine perfection. The interlocking triangle. That cannot actually be broken. Okay. Let's go through this. This is what? This is. This is. Let's just, let's just do 400. Okay. 400 plus this, that's 406. Right? 406. This is tau in numerical form is 400. Okay? 400 plus 6 is 406. 6 plus 4 equals 10. When God puts that mark on you, it is the fact that God's personal, intrinsic, sovereign kingdom has come to dwell upon and sit upon your life. So when God says to the, people, to the angel in Ezekiel, says, look, put a mark on such and such a person. He says, these are the people upon whose life I will make my platform. By the way, the reason for this, I'm being very geometric, okay? I'm, being, I'm being very Jewish, so it's very pedantic, but let's deal with it. If you look at this, this four is Dalet, right? That's Dalet. That's the open door. This is man. So is the man walking through an open door without limitation, without hindrance. A man that has been, that has the mark, the sitting of God upon him. And by the way, that's what happens when you accept Jesus Christ. When you, when, when Christ draws you to him. I don't know, how we, I don't know why we need, used to use the word accept. Because I don't get it, I don't get it, but... You know, because it's not really accept. He actually draws you to him. When Christ dwells in you, right? What happens when Christ dwells in you is that you become a human being. I shouldn't say human being. Let me, let me just, excuse me, let me use that, okay? You become, you become a person or a creation that has the capacity to go through any door, anywhere, because the mark of God is upon you for freedom, not for boundary creating. All right? I'm going to do this because I want to do this, okay? If this is 400, right? The Aleph is what? 30, right? And the what? The Tau is 400. Let's get to that 4. Remove the zeros, 4. In order for you to be able to go through these doors, you yourself must become four-dimensional. And you can only become four-dimensional if you are clothed with the four dimensions of the Word of God. The Torah, the Mishpat, the Mishpat, you know, the Ketuvim, and the Nevi'im. Right? You've got to have the four dimensions, the testimonies of God, sorry, the Eduth. Okay? You've got to have the four dimensions. There are four dimensions to the Word of God. For you to be able to actually operate at this level, okay? Now, what is this? If we talk, we call it the law, but not the law the way you think, because there's a law of grace. All right? Grace. For us, it's the law of grace. Then you have to operate in the eduth, which is the testimony. The testimony is that interaction with God that produces the voice and the DNA of God and causes it to act in a way that produces results. It's a testimony. 
the testimony of the voice of God. Then you've got to walk in judgment. Okay? Right? Then you've got to be able to see what God sees and do what God does. Because a Nevi'im, a prophet, is not just somebody who talks. It's somebody who sees. Okay? So, you get that, but this is what happens. When you walk in that fourth dimension, that's how you release the cherubic nature within you. I'll talk a little bit about this for a second. We're going to come back and connect it to the Aleph town. If you understand what the cherubic... My first experience in America after I graduated, was to actually get inside a cherubim. <laughs> but you can't get there unless you prepared yourself because it's not, a very, <laughs> it's not a very easy place to get in. Remember that the cherubim has what? Four faces. Depending on who you are talking to, when I, the one I saw had 16 wings. The one I saw had 16 wings. Four faces, 16 wings. Remember, it's the dimensions of four because the name of God is what? Four. Four letters. So now, when the first time I had this experience here in the U.S., I've had experience of angels and other kinds of beings. I mean, Ian, you know that there are some creatures you see that only God can love. That's right. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but, but, but the first time when I, was, when I was going with the name of the Lord, Yod, Hey, Vabe, it's more complicated than the simple stuff we teach you because you have to mark it in different dimensions. The way you mix it creates different things. All right? So as I was saying the name of the Lord and calling upon the name of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden in our house, the whole place became flaming fire. Because I wanted to go in. I wanted to know. I was sitting in the name of God and I was just calling upon the name. And I was calling the name of Jesus Christ because I want to make sure that, that's, that I'm not calling up something else. So I'll keep saying Jesus, you know. Make sure I'm close to the master. Make sure I'm close to Jesus. That he, I'm in his name. I'm not operating outside of his name. So as I'm doing this, I see this creature, this four-faced creature. Man, I've never seen a lion's head so big. And this is what they did. As, the, as I said the name of God, they will open up going this way, become actually full Christian, full, full lion, full eagle, full bull, and a full man. Then they will turn back and come back like a rhythm, going inside and coming back inside, going inside and coming. Then after a while, they will turn around and face, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> don't ask me. They turn the faces inside. Where lightning flashes were coming out. So I said, I want to know what's in there. <laughs> oh, guys, you know. I said, I want to know what's in there. And that's when I learned what actually happened with the covering cherub. Because when I went in there, I was in front of the ark in heaven. See? And I'm like, okay. And there's lightning, there's flashes of lightning, there's fire, there's colors, all kinds of stuff. I don't even have a way of explaining. I have no reference point in, in, in language to actually say what I saw. So I'm standing in front of the ark, and this is where I began to study. And, this is, and the Lord said to me, go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12, and you check it out. You will find out what it is that I'm talking about. He said, you have just traveled how many million light years to stand in front of one of the arks, not just one ark. And I asked this, I said, okay, if this is the case, if there's ark here, what is it doing here? He said, do you remember the ark in the temple? I said, yes. He said, no, the ark in the temple is not just a box. 
It's a transportative device. Now, I've been taught that's in Judaism, okay? I've been taught about the ark because I'm a Kohen. There are things I know that I, I think it's time to start talking about it anyway that we don't talk about. But the, 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 remember, remember that the ark was gold, pure gold, right? Surrounded by, you know, so surrounding acacia. You know acacia wood, right? Acacia wood grows in Africa. But an acacia wood seed can sit in the desert for hundreds of years without growing. It needs fire to grow. When the fire burns through the place, the seed pops. And then when rain comes, then the seed grows. The acacia wood doesn't grow higher than this, but it is this hard. It's all bumps and lumpy. All right? It grows in deserts. You know, you can't really cut it with a machete. And it has, it has thorns that are this big. That's the wood from which, by the way, fire is the only thing that can make an acacia wood grow. But it always grows with thorns. Can we just talk a little about this? Yeah. You shall be born of the Holy Spirit and water. But also, what? Shall be, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. Fire. You can't really pop without fire. <laughs> All right, let's, 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 not, let's not get... Uh, but, 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 but the, the, the process, the process of becoming, of, of, of when I, and then he, he began to show me, he said, he said, do you know that that acacia wood, I picked the acacia wood specifically because that's what you guys are. He said, you need fire to pop. He said, that's why you are under the pressure you are under, because I want you to pop. So that my water can be able to come upon you and you can actually germinate and become the tree that I called you to be. He said, but, but I can't use you until the thorns are dealt with. The thorns have to be dealt with. Right? So I said, I said okay, so the acacia is what is surrounded by gold. I said, okay, so? He says, he says, do you remember in your memory, then I went back to my memory, that the high priest will go once a year, right? Why did they tie the rope behind the high priest's foot? Everybody thinks it's so he will not sin. But the high priest literally traveled to another dimension. That's why the ark was never opened except once a year. And the high priest cannot serve more than 60 years old because, because the traveling affected his physical body. Because the blood of Jesus had not been shed. And the blood of goats and the blood of, okay. The blood of goats and the blood of animals do not have the divine DNA that protects humanity from going into another world and coming back okay. By the way, that's why you find out people who are not Christians are went into occultism. The more they go into the other world, the more wicked they become. Because there is no... Ah, I, I, I might, I might, I might just start preaching right now. So, so if you, so if you look, if you, so he said, says to me, he said, look at it. So he said, and it was covered because it was a transportative device by which I released my beings when it was open to communicate with the high priest. And the high priest was pulled in. And was taken to places and then came back. But you, you, you got to understand, the, the high priesthood was an amazing thing. Because remember, the high priest must be able to jump dimensions in order to keep Israel, what? In its point in the universe. Because the Bible says, in the day that the Lord God divided the nations or the lands or the peoples of the earth. He numbered them according to the number of the, of the children of Israel. So without that dimensional travel, Israel does not really have a lot of stuff to do for the world. So now that 
the high priesthood stopped for a while, right? So, but the real high priest who has the right came with Jesus Christ. Are you getting the point? So, he's now able to travel dimensionally in order to allow Israel to function. Not, not, not Israel as it is now. But there are people who have been washed in the blood to function the way they are supposed to function. I'm almost done because my time is almost done. All right. so, nah. Have time? All right. All right. Okay, now. So, one of the things I learned in that journey was that the high priest had to make hyper jumps. In order to stay, to bring salvation. So where did he go? He went back to the foundation. He, he went back to the foundation because the blood of goats cannot do it for Israel. So the high priest literally went and stood at the place, at the, not, I say, at the point in God where the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And in so doing, and in so doing, in so doing, gave Israel another year with God. Praise, brother. You, 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 you see, you see what's happening. So, so I, as I was, man, it was it was just too awesome. I was like, and then and then he says to me, he says, "Son, I want to show you something." He said, "What do you think happened with the ark?" He said, "When." When they picked up the manna in the wilderness, so let me show you something. You know, it's things you think you know, and God's like, That's baby stuff. Come, son, let me, uh, come, like, come, let me show you. Let me show you. See, do you, if you read the passage, you notice that the manna that they picked up spoiled the next morning, right? If it was picked up within the sixth day of the week, actually, five day of the week, it was spoiled within 24 hours. Right? 2 plus 4 equals 6. Man operating without God. Let's try it on. So they picked the manna in the time of man, which is time oriented. It's spoiled in 24 hours. 24 hours is the number of man without God. Living interspersing between darkness and light. One that does not live in, live in perfect light, but lives his, one half of his life in darkness and half of his life in light. That's what 24 hours is. A man that lives between shadow and light. That's what 24 hours is. <laughs> so, they take, they, they take the, the, the manna and they go. It gets rotten. It melts. There's junk in it. But watch this. On Shabbat night, that is early, on, early Friday morning, when they carried the same manner off, the same amount of manner, took it to the house, it lasted for 48 hours. Because the Friday and the Saturday were times focused on the presence of God. So it lasted 48 hours. 4 plus 8 equals 12. Let's try again. Are we still going? That same pot of manna that lasted 48 hours because of worship focused on the Sabbath was taken and put in the Ark of the Covenant, right? And kept in the temple, in the, in the tabernacle, then into the temple. And it lasted for a thousand years being in the presence of God. It was there until the Ark was carried away. So, so, here's the difference. The key issue, the reason I'm talking about it is because of this, this, this. This literally means, it's a word for mark, but it literally means desire. So, when God put that mark on them, he was putting a mark on them because of their desire for God and was also creating more desire. So, desire for God, desire for the presence of God creates longevity. And um, I wish I had a church in here. You know.
In the presence of the Lord, there is joy evermore. The word for joy is not just rejoicing, but it's, it's an agitation for renewal. There is a constant transfiguration that happens when the desire is activated. In I wish I had a church. Somebody say hallelujah. So God put it on them and said, you know, and, and, and by the way, this, this, there's something this does. This, this 400, and I, I will not talk to you about the zeros anymore. I don't talk about zero, but let's talk about just no, something this does. 400 over 6 is God sitting over man and tuning his DNA. Is God sitting in the platform of man, cleaning and pulling out the dark spot in his DNA, pulling everything out slowly. And that's what what happened in the Ark of the Covenant. That's why Jesus had to have the DNA of the high priest more than the DNA of David because the DNA of the high priest has been through the process of divine pulling out. There's been a pulling out of darkness from a lot of the high priests because of their travel to the point in time when Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. I wish I had somebody who understood what I'm talking about. So in the Bible, so that means that this, 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 this mark, this mark, this mark, this mark, this mark is not just God marking you for protection. It's God vibrating upon your desire and creating a frequency in your desire that allows your DNA to become circular again. You know, it's not supposed to be circular, by the way. Your DNA is supposed to be, it's not supposed to be oblong. It's not supposed to be, a, 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 what do you call it? elliptical it's supposed to be round so the more God sits on your desire the more your DNA is formed and begins to round up and all the things all the the creases that are on it um, are being smoothed away because the blood from the foundation I wish I had a church in here my God my God my God my God You don't, you, you, if, if, if you knew who you were in relation to this, if you knew what, 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 what happened to you the moment you tied onto Christ, something happened in the supernatural realm. You may not know it consciously, but you went to the beginning before the beginning. You went and you stood with God, your father, before the world was created. You were there when he was put on the ground. You were there when the blood was dropped at the point in time and commanded to expand within the Father so that everything can come into existence. You were there because you were born in eternity. You were not born in time. That spoiled in 24 hours. See, that's why I look at people who don't want to worship and I wonder what, what did, what did, what, don't you realize that whatever you put in the place of worship develops longevity? Maybe it's not working because there's no worship around it. The closer it got to the presence, the more alive, alive it became. I'll give you any testimony, you know, that my wife is here, she can bear witness. When I, when God told me, when I was trying to do something else and God said, that's not what I called you to do, you know how God will do that to you, right? He's like, that's, I didn't call you to do that, so I, I left my job. There, so, 
where I was working for a publishing company, and I, I decided, you know what? I've had experience of God. Well, you know, America will kill you. Yeah. I'm serious. Let me, you know, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be mean now. If, if, you, if you want to fast, they bring you food ten times a day. You know, it's in Africa. We can fast. We can do, you know, we, but so I got to learn some things. I said, Lord, I got to learn this thing. So eight hours a day, I will get up. She knows sometimes she was in bed. She was going, why is this man disturbing me? Because I'll be speaking in tongues, lock myself and just be speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues and speaking in tongues. That's how I saw this creature. So as I'm with God, this, so for eight hours, for three years, every day. And when she's gone, now I understand something. Because the Lord will walk in and the Lord will teach. Then some, you know, man of God, I have to confess. There was a woman who will always walk. She was so beautiful. She will walk into my, into my study chamber and I started binding it. <laughs> and it is, it wasn't until recently I said, oops, that's the spirit of wisdom. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and I said, and I said, oh, oh, please come back, lady. Lady, please come back. <laughs> then, then this is, this is something else that, in, and he said to me, he said, there are three things I had in the ark. And I said, and I put it there deliberately. He says, if you, if you guys had not shut your mind off from understanding what I was trying to do. I said, what else? He said, I put two tablets of clay inside. And he said, and these are clays that my fingers yeah. wrote yeah. upon. I said, I said, okay. Sand, clay, it's all the same to me. And he says, no, but do you understand? It's a par. A par is dust. Things I made out of dust that I gave to. By the way, the commandments was written on a tablet made out of dust. Yeah. Let's try it again. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So he says, he says, my finger is upon it. Yeah. He says, and I put it there to remind you of the possibility of the renewal of your body. Yeah. I said, he said, my finger is upon it. He said, you realize the only thing in this universe that has my immediate finger is the human body. I'm like, what? He said, he, said, he, said, he said, no, it's your body. He, says, he said, that's why humanity is so important to me because, and he said, that's why I call your body my temple because I wrote on it with my finger. And then he says to me, he says, he says, he says that tablet that is there, and it's two, because I was trying to figure out why is it two? Why can't it just be one? Why can't you just write the Ten Commandments? He says two because it's male and female. And also because the two become one and conduct power. Oh, he, says, he says the power of agreement. He says I did that deliberately. It's not that I can't write in one tablet. But I'm trying to teach you something. <laughs> so, so, so watch this. So he says to me, he says, he, says, he says, go back to your Jewish upbringing and look at what I taught you. So he said, take your talit. So I took my talit. You know, I, I was in the place. I, di I didn't go with the talit. But the minister said, take your talit. I, I was all covered. Man, I, I wish I'd brought it over here, man. That talit looks better than anything I've ever seen anywhere. <laughs> so now, he says to me, he says, there are 613 laws. I said, okay. He said, 248 organs in your body. 248 organs? I said, man, I don't look like I have all that stuff. He said, yes, you do. 248 organs. He says, and you have 365 sinews, marrows, and bone, um, uh, muscles, and bones. And he says, calculate it. And I calculate it was 610. He says, the reason I gave 600, 613, the reason I gave 613 law is a way of telling you that every 
part of your body has a frequency of my word that it will hear. And he says, and, and, and I gave you that specifically for the renewal of your body, for the healing of your body. And he says, that's why I gave. The law was not to bind you. The law was to heal you. The law was to tutor your body on how to live in eternity. And I said, God, my. He said, he said, he said, he said so if you, if you covered yourself with me, with, with what I've given you, with my word. If you wrapped yourself in my word, every, every aspect of your body will receive healing. And then he said to me, he said, I sent my word and it healed them. He says, I wrote within, when you, he said, when you, when you, when you came into contact with my son, your body received the capacity for self-renewal. I said, how do I do this? How do I get it? How do I do it? He said, the way you do it is you go into my word and you find now the frequency of the words that speak to different parts of your body. That's how, by the way, Ian, that's how I started working on my brain. I used to have headaches that will, I never told anybody, I used to have headaches that will just pierce my skull. So when I got that, I went to the scriptures and I found the word with frequency. And I do it in the Hebrew because I don't know how to do it in the English. So I take the word and I begin to repeat the word. And all of a sudden, I began to have this vision. I began to transport myself out of myself. And I look at my body. And I said, okay now. Here in this part of the brain, that's where it's happening. I just, I'm going to take this part of the brain on this side. And I'm going to connect it to this side so this side can receive life. They call it biofeedback. <laughs> Nobody told me that, but I learned it. Yeah. I learned how to use this part of the body to speak to this part, but only by connecting it with the Word of God. Yeah. Amen. I'm almost done. Okay? Just please. Just. So he says, he says, my goal is to give you a body that serves as a, as a, as a healthy platform for the operating operation of your soul and to allow your soul to develop maturity so that the spirit, so that the spirit can operate upon the soul as a platform and manifest things in the, in the, in the world. I said, you mean to tell me you care about this stuff? I just thought this was just a... He said, right. yeah. <laughs> I wrote my name upon it. Amen. Finally. Talks about life. He said, would you remember the rod of Aaron? I said, yes. I said, That's just stories. He said, I'm teaching you something. He said, the reason I allowed him to put the stuff in the ark, and I'm sitting down there. He says, do you remember that the stick was still dry? Yet it had an almond on it. It had an almond hanging on it. The tr- the, the st- according to the Hebrew, the stick, the Aaron's rod that bordered was still dead, but there was a live almond hanging on it. Oh, we say. <laughs> Here is a dead stick and a live almond is hanging on it. And it's going to teach me about dying to yourself, that it is when you are dead that you begin to produce. And he said to me, he said, he said, he said, I have created in such a way that your capacity for production is so intense and so immense. And he began to show me stuff. He says, you have to die. He said, I know I don't want to die. <laughs> you have to die. You know, when we get in the presence of God, when I first started, I was like a five-year-old. Go, no. Son, why are you doing that? Because this is my first time in your presence, Dad, and I just want to be a baby. <laughs> you know, but God will let you do stuff like that. Like, look, how many people get to come up here and see you and sit with you and talk with you? I'm a baby. Do it for me, too. So I act like a baby, and then all, you know, at a certain point, he says, okay, that's enough. You act like who you are now. I know you've had your phone. Now, this is what you do. Your capacity to produce only happens in your death. So stop fighting 
your death. Embrace your death. Die daily. And guess what? In order to produce what actually reflects divinity. So he says to me, he says, now, when the high priest went, this is what I was taught when I was growing up, that just in case, when the high priest went into the, into the temple and opened up the ark, the blue flame was on top of the ark, right? But this is what he will do. He will take the cover off and the light will stream from it. Okay? The reason the blood was first put on it, by the way, is to keep other creatures from coming from the other side. And the blood also serves as a conductor, by the way. But the blood of sheep or bulls actually served both as a conductor and as a what? And as a warning against anything that will try to come in. That's why, by the way, the blood of Jesus Christ is applied upon your heart so that nothing to keep the things there, to keep that reptilian stuff. Okay? Now, so we, we, he shows me this and he says, then I saw the high priest take the cover, turn it over. And the cherubims, rather than being on top, were inside. That's when I learned that this was what the covering cherubs were able to sit in upside down inside the glory of God and see. So they were looking into the glory. And he says, and when they were brought out, the gold of the cherubims, where the, the angels with their wings, was so bright. Because they've been in, in the glory. It was turned upside down. Then he brought it out. I thought the light was going to go out. But the light did not go out, bro. In fact, when they turned it over, the light, the blue light, just shot up straight. Yeah. And the, the angels that were on top of the ark came alive. And the wings began to make music. There was light going from one to the next, like lightning rods, just traveling, and it was being played like a string. He said to me, okay, son, I want to teach you something. I said, what? He said, we are not talking about the golden ark. He said, I'm showing this, you this because the ark is you. When you begin to learn, th th these things are symbols of, of who we are. So when you begin to understand that, that the ark is actually you, that this is what God is building, that the, the ark meets, the two cherubims meet above you. When you worship, they actually meet, the intersecting points of light meet over you. And things begin to happen in you. Your body begins to get renewed. You, 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 oh God. Your provision begins to get released. Huh? Fruitfulness begins to come out. When you, when you, the goal is not for us to carry an ark around. The goal is for us to become the ark. And in so doing, we become the gateway to different dimensions. If I permit you, you could actually travel through me. To another dimension. The problem is if I allow you to do that. I don't know what you're going to leave. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. In, in the New Testament it says, it says you are in one another. Yeah. Oh. That's right. That's right. Yeah. When we become one. The way we are supposed to become one. We will be able to travel in a more faster way. Because yeah. yeah. our waters will be connected. Yeah. Am I done? The cherubic face represents 
the four letter name of God. The Yod, He, Vav, He. The reason you put the Shin in the middle Okay, that's what it is. But it's a flame. You put the shin in the middle in order to do what? To represent the one human being that has ever carried the DNA of God without any mark of corruption. Because it is three still. See that? In him, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. There's all, all kinds of stuff. I'll let Ian. Why are you, why are you sitting down? He's sitting down. He's, 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 okay, let me. He's, he's, uh, can I have five minutes? He, I thought he was coming to me. All right, let's try again. When you do this, so we're going to do this again. When you do this, Yod, right? You can't see it from back there, so let's make it big. Let's finish this with this, okay? Remember, there were four wings over the ark of the covenant. Four wings, right? The yod is not that, the yod is not that big, but I'm just doing it that way, okay? Yod, he, bav, he. That is the name of the Father without the manifestation of the Messiah. So then you take the, the shin and you put it here. Right? And by the way, that was what Daniel became in the fire anyway. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because people, I don't have to, you know. This is a yod. So let's try this. Okay, I'm gonna show you this, and we're gonna we're gonna have to go because you're hungry and you and you need to go. This is yod. This is Yod, okay? Uh, what's, her what's her name? Sa Sasha knows this because he's Jewish, so he knows this. So Yod, watch this. Y yod is what? This is Dalet. This is Vav. This is Yod. So it's Yod, Dalet. Yod, ten, Vav, Dalet. So it's 10, 16 plus 4 is what? 20. 20 is the same as 2. All right? The meeting point, the two, okay? By the way, that's why man and woman got to get together to have a baby. And I think the problem we're going to have in the future is when we begin to manufacture these genetic babies, we don't know what spirit embod embodies them. Oh, um, did I say that? <laughs> All right. Let's, that's 20. Watch this. This is a hay, Right? Which is H A H if you use the English, okay? This is five. This is one. Are you ready for this? This is five. Which is what? Eleven. Which is again? Which is the ark again? That's the name of the Lord we are dealing with now, okay? Now, watch this. I'll show you something. Leave the sheen alone because it's a 300, okay? Let's use the verb. The vav, this is vav. Let's spell it the way it sounds. But if it was in Hebrew, we would spell it what? V, V. Because really, the, the, no, no vowels here. Okay? So if we did that, if we spelled it vav, what do we have? Six, six. Do you know what six, six, six is? Six, six is 12, right? Which is the number of the kingdom of God manifested in the platform of human DNA. Yeah. 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 Watch this. Now, when you add another six, you add an extra stuff that God didn't put there. <laughs> and can I tell you a secret? 
That's why Solomon's temple had to be destroyed. Most Jews don't like to hear that, but from where? Because he borrowed 666 talent of gold from who? From the king of Tyre. And he placed and he used it to lay the foundation of the temple. His name was Ialdobal. Ialdobal was the grandfather of Jezebel. So by doing that, he actually mortgaged Israel to Tyre. That's why Jezebel had a right to be king in, to be queen in Israel. Ian has taught you about trading. Solomon traded the kingship of Israel with Tyre. It is in the book of, of Chronicles, by the way, 666 talent of gold that Hiram gave to him. Now, are you with me? So, so this is 66, which represents Israel. So you can't really knock Israel out of anything you're doing. Then you come here, you have the sense of... But look, there are two elevens. How many, how many twos are there? Three twos. I want to show you something. This is a 20, right? So let's put it back to one, one. This is a 11. This is 11. So you got what? So God's major focus in the universe is man. Yes, Even in the name of God, he places man as the secret of his work upon the world in the world. Right. And by the way, the name of God is 26, right? The no, if you, if you count it, 10 plus 5, 15. 10 plus 10, 20. 26, right? There's something he said today that I've just got me, because we're reading, we're reading uh, Noah. So if this is 26, right? If you do it straightforward, okay? It's 26. 26 equals 8. Oh. Oh. You know, so he knows what that is? <laughs> Infinity. Yes. Yes. The conjunction of universes. All right, so when you're dealing with the name of God, within the name of God, within the name of the God of Israel, the God that is the God of the universe, is embedded the capacity to connect universes, the capacity to travel universes, and in it, the only person that can travel this name is a human being. Angels cannot travel it except by the permission of human beings. They don't call the name of the Lord. Because they don't have the DNA and the frequency that will make the name operative. Well, there's too much stuff here. But... So when Israel writes the name of God, everywhere it appears in scripture, there is, an, and every time you look at it, there is something in you that gets activated. And when Jesus died and the sin was added, guess what? This name no longer is destructive because when man sinned, when he used this name, he died just a little bit. Because he's not, he wasn't holy enough. That's why the sacrifice every day to make sure that if the name is ever used, what happens? The person is protected. But now that you have Christ, the name is given to you as a gift. That's why Jesus says, in my name, they shall do this. When they ask the Father in my name, whatever you ask, he will do it. It's no longer a name. By the way, in Israel, if you said the name openly, you were killed. You remember that, don't you? If you not, not blasphemy, if you said the name openly, you died. So, why can you say it now? Because the blood, the one who actually has the name, has come. 
You can say it now because you are in him and he is in you and nothing will happen to you. Angels cannot come running. What are you doing? Because the name has legitimately been given to you. By that name, you can create worlds. By that name, you can transform situations. By that name, you can change context. You can turn ecology around. You can transfigure situations. By that name, you can break chains. By that name, and that name... <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah! Stay in that name. And don't let some religious, okay, tell you that if you say it ten times, you are being, uh, what do they call it again? Vain repetition. Like, by the way, a vain thing in Israel and in Judaism is an idol. The name of God can never be an idol. You can say it one million times if you want to. The name of the God of Israel is not an ayin. That is nothing. It is something. It is a person. Call him as many times as you want. I'm done. Come on, come take your stuff. 